This episode was brought to you in part by Audible. With nearly 200,000 ad-free audiobooks, I'm sure you'll find something you'd like. I recommend Brain on Fire by Susanna Cahallan. It's the story of a Washington Post reporter who describes in vivid detail her battle with anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. To hear this book and get your free 30-day trial, go to audibletrial.com brainwaves and sign up. The first month is free and less than 15 bucks a month for each subsequent month with no cancellation fees. So take a minute to sign up for free at audibletrial.com slash brainwaves. There is a general idea that form in biology follows function. This is Dr. Anjan Chatterjee. You probably remember him from his show on cosmetic neurology. Right, so you learn something about the function of an organ based on its form. And the general idea was if you look at both hemispheres in the brain, uh, the form looks pretty similar. And so why would it be that something that's uh, so fundamental to how we think, which is language, should be lateralized? It wasn't immediately obvious. Form follows function. As a medical student, I remember being lectured on the traditional model of human language, what's called the wernicke lichtheim model. According to this theory of language localization within the nervous system, speech production and comprehension take place in very distinct but connected areas of the brain, and damaging one such area can produce a very clear and measurable deficit in language function. Perhaps the best and earliest proof of this language localization came from the patient Louis Victor Leborn. I'm sure many of you have heard him before, and every med student and linguistics graduate knows his story but you might remember him better by another name, Tan. Paul Broca's iconic patient from the mid-19th century. And of course LeBorn was nicknamed Tan because although his comprehensive faculties remained intact, all he could utter was a single word. Tan, 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 tan. What I mean by that is he could always understand what was being spoken to him, but his only verbal response was the nonsensical syllable, tan. After LeBourne's death, an autopsy demonstrated a clear lesion of the left inferior frontal gyrus, a site we now recognize as being the mecca of language production in the nervous system. Welcome back to Brainwaves, I'm Jim Siegler. Today we're talking about language, and even more meta, we're going to talk about how we talk about language on the wards and in the clinic when dealing with patients who have trouble speaking or if they have trouble understanding. From phonemes to functional modeling, you'll hear a bit about everything. Joining me for this installment is Dr. Anjan Chatterjee, who was just on the show to talk about cosmetic neurology in episode 58. But today, Dr. Chatterjee is coming on board because of his expertise in linguistics and language disorders. Thanks for taking the time to be with us again, Dr. Chatterjee. Happy to be here with you. So we just recited that story of Broca's seminal patient and his development of probably the first ever functional language model. Can you summarize what the lichtheim wernicke model is and how we think it plays a role in language processing? Sure. So it's worth remembering that Wernicke, when he wrote his paper, was in his uh, early 20s. So this person who wrote something in his early 20s had a huge impact on how we think about language and cognitive function. Anyway, so Broca's original observation was that a group of patients that had left frontal damage, as you said, had problem with language production. And this is an idea that had been around for a while. It's also worth going back and... For a while, meaning only a few decades. A very short duration for the history of medicine, which spans a matter of millennia. And as far as how widely accepted this concept goes, I would say it was less than popular. The localization of language function in the brain to a specific area was an extremely unpopular notion among medical professionals at the time. And you can imagine why. It would be as if I told you that your two eyes that are symmetric organs, that the left eye was specialized for processing color, and the right eye was specialized for processing shape. Your left ear was specialized for processing pitch, uh, and your right ear was specialized, for example, processing volume of sound. That would just seem bizarre. Yeah, there's no way that that could be right. But such were the notions of several preeminent neurologists at the time. There is a a French neurologist named Dax who had even proposed it uh, perhaps before Broca, but that never took took hold in the the world of academia. 
Yes, this is true. Dr. Mark Dax had presented nearly identical work to that of Paul Broca in the French Academy of Science at Montpellier 25 years earlier, and this had earned him no respect. Unfortunately, Dax would die the next year, along with any mention of his appropriately titled paper, Observations Tending to Prove the Constant Coincidence of Disturbances of Speech with a Lesion of the Left Hemisphere of the Brain. Thus was Broca able to sneak into the Hall of Scientific Fame. Also around the time of Dax's seminal publication, a German physician by the name of Franz Joseph Gall had described specific cognitive functions as belonging to very particular areas of the head. These traits, which Gall had termed mental faculties, were the product of singular mental organs that were distributed randomly across the head. One area of the skull corresponded to religiosity, another to secrecy, and so forth. This practice, the practice of phrenology, it permitted a person's skull to be carefully inspected in order to identify their mental strengths and their shortcomings. With long-term use and development of one mental faculty, like a muscle, that area would grow, and with this use, that area would wither. For instance, a bump on the top of the skull would indicate you are a very respectful person. But if you had a small dimple right in front of that area corresponding to respectfulness, then that would indicate you're somebody with low self-esteem. But many physicians refused to believe in this type of hocus-pocus. Today's equivalent of phrenologists would be people like palm readers or fortune tellers. So, when Paul Broca found a very focal necrotic lesion of the left frontal lobe in LeBourne's brain at his autopsy, and later when he observed the same lesion in an identical patient, he felt that this area must be the seat of language production, and that's how he described it. I will not deny my surprise bordering on stupefaction when I found that in my second patient the lesion was rigorously occupying the same site as the first. Nevertheless, the localization of mental faculties to specific areas of the brain began to take hold. Cases like Phineas Gage, you may remember, who survived a frontal lobe injury from a railroad accident. They began to build up, substantiating this concept of functional specialization of the brain. And, therefore, other European neuroscientists joined the foray. Wernicke's contribution was the beginnings of thinking about this as an information processing model. In the back of the brain, uh, within Wernicke's area, there would be inputs coming, and that input would be processed and fed forward to Broca's area. So this was the first time that there was an idea that different parts of the brain actually interacted in a coherent way. Uh, and then that was extended by Licktheim, who expanded on Wernicke's model. And the interesting thing about Licktheim is that from his model, the prediction was made that there would be certain kinds of deficits that nobody had really, uh, had really observed, or at least commented on. And from Licktime's model, we get the various kinds of transcortical aphasias. Which we reviewed in our first episode of the Quanta series. So check that episode out if you'd like to hear more about differentiating the unique types of aphasia syndromes and the cerebrovascular etiologies which account for them. In particular, when repetition is impaired in isolation, no ifs, ands, or buts. No ifs, ands, or buts. And speech production and comprehension remain intact. You should be thinking about large vessel disease. No, you're clearly going to be worried that they might have a critical stenosis on that side. Because that subcortical perisylvian area is supplied by collaterals coming off of the terminal ACA and MCA branches. Simple enough. And I could talk all day about large vessel disease, but let me spare you from that, and instead we can move on to some of the more interesting syndromes that affect language, what's referred to as the disconnection syndromes. Again, on John Chatterjee. The various kinds of disconnection syndromes help you localize where the lesion might be, but also helps you try to understand what's going on with patients. So alexia uh, without agraphia is typically the situation where people can't read, uh, but they can write. And the question is, why can't they read? Within the left hemisphere, particularly in the medial occipital cortex, is an area that is sometimes referred to as the visual word form area. And so sometimes you can get damage. In rare instances, you can get damage right there where people are unable to recognize the form of the word, and that information then has to be transferred over 
to parts of Wernicke's area. Some people think of this as within angular gyrus. It may be parts of posterior middle temporal gyrus, but where that word form uh, achieves its meaning. But again, a lesion in this left medial occipital cortex, or the visual word form area, is an extremely rare finding to see in a patient with alexia without agraphia in isolation. It's just too small of a lesion. So there's a more common location for this that we're usually taught about. Another way you can get alexia without agraphia is if you have a left occipital lesion, you have primary visual deficits, uh, and then you have damage to the splenium of the corpus callosum, so any visual information coming into the right occipital cortex is not being transferred over. And still, these patients have the ability to write. But the reason you can write, the centers for writing typically are more anterior. By this, he means anterior regions like the left hemisphere, primary and supplementary motor cortices, which convey the motor output for handwriting. These are preserved as are connections with other language centers which translate morphemes into graphemes, or word meaning into a written output. Each of these connections are unperturbed. This would be analogous to my asking you, I'd like you to close your eyes and now write something, right? You don't have any problem with that. And so that's essentially what's happening in alexia without agraphia. All right, some of that I did know, but I certainly couldn't articulate this as well as Dr. Chatterjee did. And even though I might have known some of this, I really couldn't tell you how often I test for agraphia in the routine hospital consult or clinic visit. Knowing more of this in better detail now, I think I'm going to be more mindful of testing writing function in my patients with a right visual field defect who may have a left occipital lobe lesion, and definitely my patients with any sort of language dysfunction. Because then the question arises, does my patient have a global aphasia or an aphemia? Right, so they're, they're virtually mute, but you kind of have the sense that they probably understand a little bit of what's going on. And most clinicians have a good sense of that. That is one place where testing writing is important. Uh, and the reason is that what you might be seeing is aphemia uh, as opposed to aphasia. And that's a situation where someone can't articulate any words, but they can write. Got it. Aphemia means they can't speak, but they can write. A graphia is the opposite. They can speak, but they can't write. What it tells you is their language system is relatively preserved. Again, this is aphemia he's talking about. And what they have is a problem of motor output. Uh, and you can think of this also as a disconnection syndrome, which is the language network is disconnected from the motor networks that are important for articulation, but not disconnected from the motor networks that are linked to the way your hand expresses itself. That was the sound of my mind being blown. The way your hand expresses itself? What he's talking about here is a difference in the motor programming involved in the careful articulation of speech and the precise production of words on paper. And this is important because it tells you their language structures are preserved, and it actually has prognostic implications, which is that people typically uh, do better over time than someone who has a global aphasia. That's really cool, right? There are definitely some huge clinical implications with all this, and with many of the other dissociative syndromes, which you can read about on our website at brainwaves.me. For the sake of time, however, we'll skip these and move on to how language is not a perfectly localizable function of the brain. It's more like language is distributed throughout many regions, and it's in a way that no specific area of the brain is actually responsible for a singular specific linguistic task. And by that I mean... You shouldn't try to reduce everything we've said today to a basic concept, like... Thinking that if you have damage in a certain part of the brain and a person has a deficit in a certain kind of function, that that function is localized in that area. Notions like Broca's area is responsible for speech production, or Wernicke's area is responsible for speech comprehension, these are really imprecise, and in reality they're completely inaccurate. What we've actually learned so far is that a lesion to Broca's area can cause a deficit in language production, and a lesion to Wernicke's area can cause a deficit in language comprehension. This is the concept that an area of the brain is necessary but not sufficient to carry out the function we traditionally ascribe to it. All it's telling you is that part of the brain might be a necessary component of that function, but it's not the same as saying that the entire function is localized there. 
So to give you a trivial example again, I said I gave the example if you might be blind, if you say that uh, someone who has uh, genetic retinal disorder and is blind on that basis, you would agree that input from the retina is necessary for vision, but you wouldn't want to say that all of visual processing is located in the retina. And this is an important concept to be aware of because of its implications in functional recovery after injury. Because of the distribution of these neural networks, impairment in a single node may temporarily disrupt the function of that network if there's enough redundancy in the circuitry to assume that node's function over time, after which you may recover. More simply, the more preserved the network is and the fewer nodes that are damaged, the more likely one is to recover after that insult. And for language, it's not just the network on the left hemisphere and the majority of your right-handed patients. The right hemisphere also plays a role in recovery. A couple of things. Uh, one is there is some evidence, uh, if you just talk about language per se, that homologous areas in the right hemisphere play a role in recovery. There are also other communicative functions that the right hemisphere plays that uh, you can think of them as paralinguistic as opposed to linguistic in the narrow sense. And when I say linguistic in the narrow sense, I mean phonemes. Meaning units of sound that give rise to words. Words themselves and syntax. Which encompasses the rules by which words are put together in order to convey meaning. But more broadly, when we communicate, a lot of our communication happens through the emotional tone of what we're talking about. So if you are expressing something with anger or with sadness or you're conveying happiness, that is also a very important part of how we communicate with each other. And, and that is what seems to be disproportionately affected when people have right brain damage. And so many of you may have the ex clinical experience. You have someone with a right frontal stroke uh, and they just speak in a monotone. Kind of like Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. I have a joke for you. The government in this town is excellent and uses your tax dollars efficiently. You see? <laughs> well, at least he speaks in monotone until you hear him giggle. You know, you would think that they're devastated, they should be upset. But they're not. And they're not depressed or melancholic. They simply lack an emotional prosody meaning they're unable to infuse any sort of feelings into their speech. They're just... flat. Clinically, it's also an important thing to know because sometimes patients with uh, right brain damage, especially more posteriorly, might not comprehend the emotional prosody of people who are speaking with them. And this is a very important thing to let family members know because uh, with people that have had right hemisphere damage, when you're communicating with them in everyday life, it is incumbent on the person who's talking to be explicit about their emotions, to say, I am now angry with you or I am excited for you because they might not get that from, your, from the, the emotional intonations in your voice. Which is why whenever I speak with Erica, I try to be as to the point as I can possibly be, which means I probably come off like some moron with a large right frontal lobe lesion. God, do you think I have a brain tumor? Uh, I hope not. Me either. And on that note, I think we'll wrap up the show for this week. I'd like to thank Dr. Chatterjee again for joining me. How do you think this talk went compared to your first interview for Brainwaves? Yeah, we meandered a fair amount, but, you know, and went into some more obscure topics. But I'm sure you can, you know, decide what, what fits or what doesn't in the narrative of the podcast. Definitely will. Great chatting with you again, Anjan. Always a pleasure. Thanks for doing this. For more information on the localization of language disturbances, Take a look at what we posted on the blog at brainwaves.me from this week. In case you haven't already, check out Dr. Chatterjee's earlier interview in episode number 58 on cosmetic neurology. It was a pretty interesting show about behavior modulation and neuroethics. As always, you can find more information about us by following Brainwaves on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio and on Facebook at facebook.com slash brainwavespodcast. This episode was produced by Jim Siegler. Music by Josh Woodward and Little Glass Men. I'm Erica Mejia. Thanks for tuning in.